straight into sewage. And I'm asking you about that because our readers, particularly on The Telegraph, are absolutely furious at some of these figures. We learn that 1.75 million hours of 2022 were spent with water companies pouring raw sewage into our rivers. You were Environment Secretary. Did this happen on your watch? How has this happened? Why isn't this illegal? Oh, this has happened for uh, over 100 years, and it's a legacy, really, of the Victorian infrastructure that we've got on sewage. And actually, I was probably the first Secretary of State to really start to address this. When I became Secretary of State in 2020, uh, I actually uh, introduced a new uh, spending review plan for Offwatch. They uh, then required uh, companies to start investing in this. It will take time. But last July, uh, that culminated in a, a plan to reduce the use of storm overflows, um, significantly cutting them by about 25 percent over the next two to three years and actually um, re re significantly reducing the harm altogether by 2050. So are off what or indeed the Environment Agency to be found wanting here. There's been a lot of criticism, particularly of the EEA, when it comes to, say, not dredging rivers and co contributing to flooding. From the punter's point of view, from listeners and viewers of this show, they'll be looking at this and going, this is just an absolute environmental scandal. Well, there's two separate things that have been going on. First is on storm overflows, which is when you get a huge uh, flood event and to uh, prevent the system being overwhelmed and sewage literally coming up through toilets into people's homes, which is what would happen. Uh, they have to have these emergency release uh, overflows, uh, which they use. Now, that's usually very diluted. In fact, often it's just street drainage. It's uh, water that's come off the streets rather than the foul uh, water system. That's one thing. That's always been part uh, illegal and part of their permits. But there's a question about whether the EA were monitoring those permit conditions properly, and that's being investigated now. And there's a separate problem, uh, which is some sewage companies were releasing treated uh, sewage, but slightly prematurely. Uh, and that is another uh, issue. We don't know whether that's because the water companies themselves hadn't realised that and hadn't detected it, um, but it has now been detected, and that's also uh, subject to an investigation in some cases. So is it just that we have to put up with the fact that sewage in some form or other is always going to be released into our rivers. Well, it, it's, it's always been thus and therefore it always will be thus. Well, the use of these storm overflows, although the headline figures announced this week sound high, it's been reducing for four years. Uh, it dropped dramatically last year, partly due to drier weather, it has to be said. But we have a plan to reduce um, the harm from these by 25% by 2025. And, and then beyond that, £56 billion of investment that's already started to be spent is going to you know, effectively reduce uh, the harm from these storm overflows by 2050. I think you're always going to need uh, some of them because to, to eliminate them altogether, you need to spend about £600 billion uh, mm. on our sewage infrastructure. And that's actually disproportionate to the problem. And if you spent £600 billion on that... Uh, you would see water bills probably treble yeah. and you actually wouldn't see a corresponding environment. You seem to be saying that impact. this isn't too much as a problem and you've then got campaigners like Fergal Sharkey sort of tearing their hair out, got people writing into their droves thinking that it really is a massive problem. Well, it's not a new problem. So it's been yeah, a problem it's down... A problem even if it's it's not been a new. problem down the decades. It's something that we've been addressing. Um, sewage infrastructure, it's, it, these are long-term uh, challenges. And yes, I know that people want an instant solution. We've given them uh, an instant solution in the case that there was a plan last July, £56 billion to okay. be spent on it, but it will take three years to get a 25% reduction and probably 10 years uh, to get it down further. The people just have to accept that it takes a bit of time and then it's not a new problem. OK. Should people swim in our rivers? Uh, yes. Um, they're and safe, they do. are they? And they do. They're yes, yes, they do. Grooming with sewage? Uh, no, uh, they're not. So these are tend to be um, uh, releases that happen uh, at the point at which you get um, uh, severe storm overflows. Uh, we do um, have ways of, uh, you know, we have bathing water quality beaches that are designated as such. And we started to designate bathing water quality in rivers as well. And there has been an improvement in, in water quality in rivers in recent decades. Um, the government this week has announced its plans on net zero and that they're going to continue with this target. Um, I think there's a great deal of concern um, among the GB audience that it's actually going to cost them more money, uh, not least if they have to start replacing diesel and petrol cars for very costly electrics, if they're going to have to start getting a heat pump. Prices for those start at £8,000, I believe. What's your view on all this? I mean, is environmental policy fit for purpose if it makes the poor poorer? 
I think even if you, um, and there are people who are sceptical about the need uh, and wisdom of going for net zero by 2050, I, I happen to support it. But even for those who don't, there's an energy security issue here as well. We probably passed peak oil about a decade ago, and, and that means that um, resources of oil and gas are going to be diminishing. Although probably... there's this new oil field, apparently, uh, this... Uh oil field that's being um, built, is it Rosefield, Rosamond, which is going to apparently blow the complete carbon reduction budget for the government? Well, um, what I would say is there's a role definitely for gas in the transition because it's central to get what we call blue hydrogen. And hydrogen is Rose going to be bank, an sorry. important um, fuel to use for particularly uh, lorries, heavy goods vehicles and some other purposes as well. But, you know, we, oil is a diminishing resource. It's increasingly going to be in the hands of uh, regimes that we can't trust, as we've seen in the last year. And therefore, you've got to, as a point of um, uh, energy security, have a strategy to reduce your reliance on fossil fuels. But and the that's EU have put a pause on their um, plans to try and um, cut out fossil fuels. They've said, look, this is just not practicable because of the war in Ukraine, because of surging energy prices. In the UK, people are seeing their energy bills go up. Now they're going to be potentially having to pay more for their cars in future, going to have to ditch cars with scrappy schemes that don't seem to give them the money that they deserve. Five minutes ago, we're told to drive diesels. The next, we're told to abandon them. You can understand the frustration of the UK taxpayer on this stealth taxes put into their energy bills because of green levies that they have no control over. And actually, our emissions are 1% of the world's carbon emissions. So we're all doing the right thing. What difference does it make if China and Russia keep on belching out emissions like Billio. Absolutely, and that's right. It's a global endeavour, and that's why um, uh, the, the COP event that we have, although people will criticise that, is um, absolutely necessary to get the rest of the world to act as well. But, you know, my view on this is uh, when it comes to, to vehicles, um, it would be new sale vehicles only, so there'll still be a second-hand market for petrol and diesel cars for some years to come uh, But electric cars, have you got an electric car? I haven't, no, because for me, at the moment, it doesn't work because uh, I sometimes have to make a very very long journey to Cornwall. It doesn't, well, it doesn't work. work for many people, Exactly, does it? and that's why... Why is the government pushing it then? Well, that's why you can still get um, uh, petrol and diesel vehicles at the moment. The reason it doesn't work is the technology is not quite there to deal with the range and the infrastructure for charging is not quite there. But it's only until 2030. There. That's seven years away. Exactly, and, and a lot can happen in seven years. Look at what's happened in the last seven years. It was inconceivable you would have had any electric vehicles. Now a significant number of but those... But the Europeans aren't phasing out there, so why are we doing it? Uh, well, the government still judges, uh, and they've obviously looked at this, that it's right to keep that target in place and it would be premature uh, to make a change to that at the moment. Uh, I think if you get that infrastructure in place and you send a clear, consistent... But isn't consistent... it just punishing poor people? Uh, no, it's not, because most poor people actually would buy a, a second-hand car. And, uh, there are no second-hand electric cars available right no, now. No, but there are, second -hand, there are second-hand diesel and petrol cars and will continue to be for many years to come. You're only talking about new sales uh, of cars that would be phased out by 2030. What about heat pumps? Do you think poor people can afford to change their boiler and spend eight grand minimum on one? Now, on this, I've argued a change and we'll be seeking to, to uh, amend the energy bill when it comes back to the House of Commons because we've got a lot of off-grid gas properties uh, or properties that are used typically kerosene heating oil mm. and you actually can make an adaptation to those existing boilers so that they will run on something called hydro-treated vegetable oil, which this is... This is a, your private member's bill. That's, that's right, yeah. yeah. And this is a good idea. This is a practical solution. So people who can heat their homes with vegetable oil should get VAT reductions. Exactly. And, and for, for, the, for a small cost of a couple of hundred pounds, they can make an adaptation to their existing boiler, and then we can get nearly a 90% reduction in carbon very quickly. So I'm hoping the government will take this up, because my view is you shouldn't... Instead force of heat it. pumps. Yes, because uh, an air source heat pump will be right for some properties, but not for many. They tend to need a lot of insulation and if you've got old cottages uh, insulation means less ventilation that means mold and damp and so on so it's not the right technology for some of these older so properties. the energy secretary grant shap says he's going to get a heat pump is he is he wrong to do that is that a stupid idea because they're not uh, fit for purpose no it'll be right for some homes and um, ground source heat pumps could work really well on what's called district level heating where you take a whole estate and move it on to a, a ground source heat pump there's a role for air source heat pumps with some individual properties but I actually think for those so-called off-gas-grid properties that currently use uh, kerosene predominantly, yeah. we actually should enable them at very low cost uh, to adopt to a renewable heating fuel that would actually reduce carbon far faster than trying to require them to have an air source heat pump. Can I talk to you about the CPTPP? 
which is the new trade deal that's been signed in the South Pacific. Yeah. You were quite scathing about Liz Truss on trade deals. Do you regret that now? They, she's done quite well, hasn't she, followed up by Kemi Badnock? Well, no, um, uh, Kemi Badenoch has done uh, reasonably ah, well on this. Why won't you credit Truss with this? Well, because all she did was, um, on, on CPTPP, was, to be honest, send the letter saying she would like to join. There weren't really any... Oh, uh, do you not uh, think she was a very good trade secretary, though? I was critical of, of what was done on the uh, Australia trade deal. And the reason I was critical is I wanted the government to learn the lessons. And the lesson is that in a trade agreement, any trade agreement... Yeah, uh, the negotiation you... of this deal has been going on for two years, though, hasn't it? And she was trade secretary and she was foreign secretary and she was Prime Minister. Well, so you I don't was, give her any credit at all? N the, the big decisions on this were starting to be only just about made in around July when uh, Anne-Marie Morris was there and, and Liz Truss actually had been out of the role for about six you months. You were worried about the Australian deal, but won't this also mean that cheap meats get imported into the UK and flood the British market? Uh, no, because you've got limits on this. So my criticism of the Australia deal was that it was very one-sided. It gave full liberalisation when we should have had uh, what's called an enduring TRQ, and that's a, a TRQ is a fixed volume uh, of product that you allow in. What they've done on the CPTPP is secured a, a much more balanced reciprocal exchange of opportunities with fixed volumes so within no parameters. So no credit to trust at all? Do you just not really like trust? Uh, I, I supported Liz Truss on lots of things and right, worked not with this, her. Though. I, I disagreed with the approach she took on the Australia trade deal, and I've been very uh, honest about that. I think sometimes, um, you know, ideological views about why didn't you resign over it at the time then, if you were that opposed to it? Um, because I, I secured um, a termination clause in the Australia trade deal, um, which means any government in future uh, can terminate the agreement with six months' notice in writing. That was important, a very important safeguard, given the lack of others. And I also managed to secure uh, staging over 15 years, which wasn't ideal, okay. and I would have held out for way more. But you think this is a decent deal, just to find I think this finish. is a reason. This is a balanced reciprocal exchange of opportunities with the right kind of safeguards. And that's what a trade deal should be. It shouldn't be some uh, ideological approach that says we want to liberalise for the sake of it. No. Uh, it is a balanced exchange with other countries that are also looking after their interests. George Eustace, thank you for joining me this thank morning. You. Lovely to see you.